Maya McGinnis. I uh, run the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, and I'm the Director of the Fiscal Policy Program here at New America Foundation. Uh, and today we are joined by Peter Orzog, the Director of the Congressional Budget Office. Um, and this is actually the third time that we have released, or CBO has joined us to release one of their long-term budget projections. What's really interesting today, and I think what's going to really have a huge mark on the whole discussion, um, is that CBO is updating the way that they do their long-term health care projections, which obviously uh, has a huge imp impact on all long-term budget projections. Um, and that's the portion of what we're going to be talking about today. This is a report, the long-term outlook for health care spending. Uh, just a few remarks before my voice does run out on health care. One of the things um, I think many of you have probably experienced, I have experienced with regularity, is we all know that health care is the biggest uh, issue in terms of the long-term budget. There is pretty much not a budget or fiscal policy conference that I go to that somebody doesn't say knowingly, well, the real problem is health care. And we all nod, and then we all kind of stop, because nobody actually knows so much about what to do about health care. Um, one of what I think the most impressive things going on at the Congressional Budget Office is they are really taking the lead <coughs> excuse me, on um, developing the capacity for a better understanding on health care, both short-term policy options and long-term projections. And this is going to give so many of the analysts who know that this is probably the single most important issue um, impacting long-term fiscal projections and the health of the budget. Uh, much more substance with which to work and hopefully I think move the debate forward in a, in a large way that we haven't seen recently. Um, just a quick note about Congressional Budget Office for those of you, may, maybe you've heard the story before, but I am probably the single biggest fan of CBO out there. I feel like I should have started the fan club in that uh, about 10 years ago when I was working on Wall Street, I discovered a CBO report about the budget and just read it and it was so accessible, uh, made me realize I wasn't interested in Wall Street, I was in fact interested in the budget. And this was before the internet, or at least before I knew about the internet. And I went to the Congressional Budget Office and I found out they give away the reports for free. And I thought this was just the neatest thing. I like loaded up on reports and wouldn't go there all the time. So I have uh, long been a fan of the Congressional Budget Office. And then since I started running the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, uh, I've been very gratified that all the previous directors are on our board of directors. So I get to work closely with them. Um, there is one note of sympathy I have for the staff there, and that is that I have recently discovered that the directors of CBO are the biggest caffeine addicts of all time. And I say this because when Doug holtz Aiken came here the past couple times to release the long-term budget projections, he let me know that all he really lives on is Diet Coke and Twizzlers. So we would have Diet Coke and Twizzlers. Now anybody who's ever been at a conference with Peter or has watched him testify knows that Peter has this bizarre backpack that's sort of like um, the car that all the clowns come out of, he can pull out of his backpack sort of every economic report that's ever been written or is relevant to anything he's talked about, and then five or six Diet Cokes on top of it. So I know for the staff that uh, people are working at three in the morning to come up with these new health care numbers, because anybody who's this caffeinated cannot sleep much. So we've provided you with what we hope will be sufficient, Peter. There's more if you need them. Um, <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us today. I know this is going to be a really interesting discussion. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for uh, having me, especially thank you for the Diet Coke. I do wish that, uh, I wonder if there's an ethics issue. I think, it, I think we're all right. <laughs> the reason I'm here today is that we are going to be releasing a long-term budget outlook as we have in the past, next month. We are going to now start releasing our long-term budget outlook every year instead of every two years, which had been the norm before that. And a key part of our long-term budget outlook involves health care. Because we are uh, presenting a new methodology for projecting health care costs and because uh, health care costs are the key to our long-term fiscal picture, we're releasing this report separately today and then there will be uh, an overall fiscal long-term outlook that's released in December. We all know that health care costs have been increasing. If you look uh, between uh, 1960 and today, health care costs more than tripled as a share of the economy from under 5% of GDP, or gross domestic product, in 1960 to more than 15% today. And the key question, we all expect that there will be further increases in the future, the key question for our purposes is how to project forward what will happen in the future under current federal policy. And there are a variety of ways that uh, that kind of analysis could be undertaken. A natural starting point is what 
growth rates we observed in the past. And the way that many analysts measure those growth rates is the so-called excess cost growth rate. And excess does not mean uh, <coughs> excessive. It means uh, just the cost growth per beneficiary above and beyond growth in income per capita and above and beyond uh, demographic effects. So excess is just a technical term rather than a normative one. And the bottom line highlighted in yellow shows you that the average excess cost growth rates for Medicare, for Medicaid, for the rest of the health system, and for total health spending between 1975 and 2005. We started that analysis in 1975 because that allowed sufficient time after the introduction of Medicare and Medicaid to not have the results uh, affected by the startup of those programs. Some people looking at this chart note that growth rates since 1990 have been lower than for the 1975 to 2005 period as a whole, which is correct. And therefore, some people say, well, you're starting off, your jumping off point for any future projections should not be the average over the past 30 years, but should be the average since 1990. We wound up rejecting that approach because uh, many of the things that appear to have reduced the rate of cost growth during the 1990s may well turn out to be one-time shifts in the level of costs rather than changes in the underlying growth trend. And therefore, you don't want to put too much emphasis on what happened since uh, 1990. For example, the expansion of managed care in the private part of the health system likely reduced costs relative to what would otherwise have been the case. But it's unclear whether that, that is a, uh, affects the growth rate or just a one-time shift. If you observe a one-time shift over some period of time, it will temporarily show up as a reduction in the growth rate. And to some significant degree, we believe that's what happened during the 1990s. So for that reason, and also because if you look from year to year, there doesn't appear to be any significant trend over time. And there's also a lot of volatility from year to year, which highlights the benefits of taking an average over a longer period. We decided to, to start with the average from 1975 forward. So the jumping off point for our future projections will be that bottom row of excess cost growth. One point to note about that is that you can observe that the, the rates are fairly similar in Medicare and Medicaid and the rest of the health system. That is to say, costs have tended to track each other fairly closely on average over long periods of time. We expect that that will indeed be the case in the future, but it is not a feature of the scenarios that I'm going to present to you because in order for that to happen, federal policy will have to change. So the historical period that we observed uh, for these data involved a series of policy changes that wound up resulting in healthcare costs in the different parts of the health system tracking each other fairly closely. That will likely occur in the future, but it will require a change in federal policy in order to make it happen. The other thing to note about these excess cost growth rates, as you can see on this chart, is that they bounce around from year to year. In some years, uh, Medicare and Medicaid are above the rest of the health system. In some years, they're below. So there are periods when uh, Medicare, say, is growing faster than the rest of the health system and periods in which it's not. And again, on average, the rates over the past uh, three decades have tended to track each other fairly closely. OK, so we have the, you know, something like 2 to 2.5% average growth rate over the past three decades. And that, that can be a jumping off point for future projections. If we simply just took those future project that that those growth rates and said what happened in the past will happen in the future, you wind up with this chart. And there are two problems with this chart. One is that by the end of the period, healthcare is 100% of GDP and will soon exceed it. And while uh, we can illustrate the implications of current federal policy, a mathematical impossibility like that is not generally a desirable feature of a scenario. The second uh, observation which is related is that even in the absence of federal policy changes, one would anticipate that as the share of healthcare spending in the economy reached 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent, there would be significant pressure at the level of employers, households, insurance plans, state governments to try to constrain cost growth, even in the absence of federal policy. 
And so embedded in the scenarios that we present is an assumption that those other sectors of the health system will act to slow cost growth as the share of healthcare costs rise. And in particular, that they will adopt potentially painful steps like uh, tighter utilization management, slower adoption of technology, higher cost sharing, more restrictive employer plans or uh, less access to employer-sponsored coverage, and other things that may ultimately reduce <coughs> the rate of cost growth, but uh, <laughs> that are not necessarily pleasant to live through. In particular, the assumption that we use to pin down the rate of growth in the rest of the health system is that households, employers, and other entities will not allow more than 100% of productivity growth to go into healthcare. That is to say, if the overall economy becomes more productive by $100, so all of our income goes up by $100, we will not allow $150 to go into healthcare because that would require a reduction in cars and uh, houses and other things that we consume. By constraining non-health inflation-adjusted consumption to not decline, we then get a rate of growth in the rest of the health system that involves a slowing from those historical growth rates and that would be accomplished through many of the steps that I described. There would then be some spillover effects or other effects for Medicare and Medicaid even under current policy. In particular, Medicaid, uh, conceptually what we are trying to do in these um, scenarios is keep federal policy fixed, but that doesn't mean keeping state policy fixed. And since Medicaid is a mixed federal state program, state governments under these scenarios have the flexibility to respond to rising costs, and we believe that they would. And then even for Medicare, the changes that the rest of the health system would adopt, whether in practice norms or in technological adoption or um, other things, would, would likely have some effect on Medicare costs because to some degree the health systems are integrated. Doctors see both kinds of patients, for example. In addition to that, there is some scope under current regulation to adopt cost-saving uh, approaches. And the rising premiums and cost-sharing requirements for Medicare beneficiaries could also help to restrain cost growth in the system, even under current law. So in particular, our assumption is that if, for example, and as an illustration, cost growth in the rest of the health system slowed from 2% a year to 1% a year, cost growth in Medicaid would slow from 2% to 1.25%, so basically a 75% spillover, and cost growth in Medicare would slow from 2 to 1.75%, i.e. a 25% spillover. Less effect on Medicare because the constraint that federal policy is fixed is more, more of a constraint for that program than for Medicaid. The result of all that is the following. These are our central projections of healthcare spending. <coughs> in terms of overall healthcare spending, after uh, the share of healthcare spending in the economy more than tripled between 1960 and today, we project that it would more than double again between today and 2035, rising to more than 30% by that year. In terms of Medicare and Medicaid, we project that spending today, which is 4% uh, of the economy, would more than triple by 2050, reaching 12% of the economy by that year, and almost 19% of the economy, or roughly 19% of the economy, by the end of the projection window. One of the implications of the projection methodology is that Medicare and Medicaid account for a larger share of the health system over time precisely because federal policy is held fixed. And I want to emphasize again, this is not a prediction of the future because federal policy will change, but federal policy changes will be necessary to avoid that implication of an unchanged set of policies. I think you can even see from the chart that Medicare and Medicaid are consuming a larger share of the overall health system in these scenarios. Another way of calibrating the projections is to compare them to some previous scenarios that CBO has put out. In previous work, instead of picking a central tendency for healthcare spending, uh, we tended to just use different scenarios for that rate of excess cost growth. And in particular, the 1% number, which is that uh, second line from the bottom, and then the 2.5% uh, 
excess cost growth were commonly referred to in CBO publications, and I think you can see that our new set of central projections lie in between those two, in part because of these spillover effects and the activity that the rest of the healthcare system would undertake in order to slow cost growth, even again in the absence of federal policy changes. Another calibration or another comparison that can be undertaken in these with our projections is to compare us to the intermediate estimates of the so of sorry the Medicare trustees and what you see from that comparison is that over the next uh, couple decades the two compare the two projections track each other fairly closely one reason for that is that the first 10 years of our projections are based on our baseline outlook our budget baseline and then the system that I described kicks in in 2018 Similarly, the CMS uh, actuarial projections are, um, are similar over the next decade, and then you see a little bit of difference uh, opening up thereafter. In the long run, we are higher than the trustees. By the end of the projection window, we are 50% higher than the intermediate uh, estimates of the CMS uh, actuaries or the trustees. And I will just briefly describe that the way that they do their projections <laughs> involves from year 25 to year 75 an average excess cost growth rate of 1%. And, they, and that's an average over the, that 50-year period. They have slowing within the period. But we do not constrain our system to, uh, to have that 1% average growth rate from year 25 to year 75. Instead, we adopt the methodology that I've already described, and the result is that we wind up higher than they are by the end of the 75th year. But I would also emphasize that the key message in both reports is quite similar, which is under current policy, spending on these two programs, Medicare and Medicaid, will rise sharply. And furthermore, uh, over the next couple of decades, there isn't much difference at all in the precise magnitudes of that increase. Another essential point to take away from the report is that we have been largely misdiagnosing the nation's fiscal problem. And I am guilty of this, as uh, are many of my former colleagues in the think tank community and elsewhere. In the media, the nation's long-term fiscal problem is typically described as being driven mostly by the coming retirement of the baby boomers, the, the tidal wave of, uh, of aging. And while that is a factor, it is not even close to the most important factor. This chart shows you the effect, uh, the pure effect of the aging distribution of the population, so that is that the population is growing older in that dark blue line, or the dark blue area. The light blue area is the effect of cost growth above and beyond aging and above and beyond GDP growth. And I think it's pretty obvious from the graph that while aging is there, or the effect of the uh, aging population is present, it's not the dominant force. And in fact, by, 20, by the end of the projection window, the aging uh, distribution, or the, sorry, the aging of the population distribution accounts for only about 10% of the projected increase in Medicare and Medicaid costs. So that is not where the money is. The money is in the light blue area. And we are paying far too little attention to what could help bend that curve in the light blue area, and far too much attention to, in effect, the, the impact of that dark blue area. And again, I would say I'm just as guilty as anyone is. But I'm hoping to change that. I'm, I'm reforming myself. Um, in terms of what could help bend that curve, it is also important to realize that embedded in the central long-term fiscal challenge facing the United States, which is that light blue area, there is a substantial opportunity. And that opportunity is the ability to potentially take costs out of the healthcare system without harming quality. There is often described a medical effectiveness curve, which suggests that over some range of spending, as you spend more, health outcomes improve. But at some point, that curve flattens out and might even turn down. I believe there's a substantial amount of evidence that in the United States, we're either on the flat part or the downward sloping part of that curve. What is that evidence? I think the most compelling evidence, perhaps, is the very substantial variation in healthcare costs per beneficiary in Medicare, which, by the way, also occur in Medicaid and in the rest of the health system. Fact number one about the nation's healthcare system is substantial amounts of regional variation 
in Medicare, in Medicaid, and in the rest of the health system for reasons that cannot be explained by the underlying riskiness of the patients or the cost of building a hospital or local wage rates or what have you. I like to say someone came up to me at a speech a couple of weeks ago and said, I have the answer, it's cloud cover in different parts of the United States. But a group up at Dartmouth has spent basically its entire professional career trying to explain this variation and can reduce the variation perhaps by a third or so when you throw in the various control variables. So a very substantial amount of variation in different parts of the United States that don't correspond to improvements in outcomes. And in fact, if you look at the simple correlation across states, higher spending states have, if anything, worse health outcomes than the lower spending states. Opening up the obvious question, why is this happening? And how much money is there there? Let's answer that second question first. I have a panel of health advisors that includes many of the top health economists from across the country. I ask them the question, what share of health care costs do you believe could be removed from the health care system, hypothetically at least, leave, a, leave apart the political economy of the difficulty of obtaining the savings, but just in terms of an opportunity, could be removed from the health care system without harming quality? And a few people said I can't possibly answer that question, but the people who answered it uh, gave uh, answers that range between 5 and about 50 percent, with the most common answer being 30. 30 percent of our nation's health care spending, which now is about 16 percent of GDP, is about 5 percent of the economy. 5 percent of the economy for no adverse consequences to health is, to say it's an incredible opportunity, <laughs> is an understatement. That is a huge amount of money for what many of the nation's leading health experts believe is no adverse consequences in terms of health outcomes. So why is this happening? Uh, let's try to get under the hood a little bit more in terms of this variation. Because if you look at, uh, this chart might be a little bit difficult to understand, but uh, basically if the dot is right near the vertical line, that means there's not very much variation. And if the dot's pretty far from the vertical line, there's a lot of variation. So one thing to note about this variation is, in terms of the things we know that work, there's not that much variation across different parts of the United States. So uh, it is best practice to administer uh, aspirin uh, upon admission to a hospital for a heart attack. Basically, all re uh, there's not a lot of variation in, in that kind of uh, practice. Where there are tons, of, where there's a lot more uh, variation is precisely in the sort of more nebulous areas <laughs> of, say, imaging or diagnostic tests where it's not entirely clear what should happen. Let me give you an example of an MRI. MRIs have generated huge benefits in terms of being able to diagnose things that we, didn't, uh, we weren't able to do before. However, that MRI then gets applied in lots of settings where it has a very, very small, if any, probability of affecting the diagnosis. That drives up costs without improving anyone's quality. And I, I, I'm sure you may have experienced this. I've experienced this personally where doctors were urging MRIs on me for no discernible uh, probability of changing a pretty clear diagnosis. Replicate that thousands and thousands and thousands of times, and you get the kind of variation that we see in, the, in that chart for no uh, discernible improvement in quality. Another, another perspective on the same point, if you look at uh, hip, fracture surgery, hip fracture cases, if you fracture your hip, you're going to be hospitalized. The cost of hip fracture uh, cases doesn't vary that much across parts of the United States because it is clear what should happen. In other cases like back surgery where it's not so clear what the medical benefits are or what should happen, there's a lot more variation. Furthermore, if you look at the follow-up cost to hip fracture uh, hospitalization, there's very little evidence, if any, on whether you should go and see the doctor four times a month or twice a month or three times a month. And there's, again, more variation where there's less certainty on what works and what doesn't. It leads to the obvious conclusion that if we had uh, a much larger share of health care costs that were delivered based on direct evidence, this variation might be much less substantial. I'll come back to that in a moment. But before I do, the other thing that people note about that chart is they say, well, yeah, that's great, but those dark red areas, they have a lot of uh, academic medical centers, and we all know that the academic medical centers in the United States are the best in the world in terms of the health care that they deliver. So I want to just explore that for a second, and courtesy of uh, a colleague at Dartmouth, 
refer to the cost per beneficiary in the last six months of life at three top medical centers in the United States, whose names will undoubtedly be familiar to you if you follow healthcare. <coughs> at one, and, uh, and uh, again, last six months of life, so it's uh, fairly clear that all of these cases are serious and potentially high cost. The quality measures that we have for these three centers don't vary that much, which is the top row. The cost per beneficiary at one of the medical centers is slightly more than $50,000 on average. At another uh, center is about half that. It leads to the obvious question of how can the best medical care in the world cost twice as much as the best medical care in the world? And one of the reasons is but if you start to look at physician visits or medical specialists or hospital days where again it is not clear that we're getting anything more in terms of outcomes these are sort of more uh, discretionary kind of things there's a lot more of that activity at the higher cost center than at the lower cost center again for no discernible improvement in quality I believe therefore that the reason that we have this variation in practice norms in the United States is that too small a share of the health care delivered in the United States is backed by specific evidence on what works and what doesn't. In the absence of that evidence, social norms among practitioners and uh, physicians vary across different parts of the United States. We have more interventionist and less interventionist norms. The more interventionist norms are not backed by solid scientific evidence and therefore they drive up costs without improving quality. And we have a payment system that facilitates that by being largely a fee-for-service uh, system in which it doesn't really matter whether that MRI has any value. As long as you do it, you get paid for it. The obvious, uh, one obvious uh, approach to addressing that then involves building out the information base on what works and what doesn't, and we can talk more about that if, uh, if people are interested, and then tying financial incentives both for providers and to consumers to the evidence on what works. And I, I'll talk briefly about the consumer side and then I want to come back to the provider side at the end. One of the other little remarked uh, things in healthcare is that if you look at out-of-pocket expenses, so co-payments and, and things like that, for example, the share of total health expenditures in that form has plummeted over the past few decades, from about a third in 1975 <laughs> to about 15% today. And all of the evidence suggests that that lower out-of-pocket share drives up costs, either a little bit if you believe the results from the RAND experiment, or a lot if you believe the results that Amy Finkelstein and others have done with regard to the introduction of Medicare. But directionally, when we each pay somewhat less out-of-pocket for that additional MRI, we drive up costs for all of us, and, and overall costs are therefore increased. One obvious approach, therefore, is to introduce more cost sharing on the consumer side, and there are many uh, proposals floating around to do that in various different forms. There is, however, an inherent limit to the capability of consumer cost sharing to reduce costs. It's there, but limited. And the limitation comes from the fact, this is the second big fact of healthcare, which you see in Medicare, Medicaid, and the rest of the health system. Healthcare costs are very concentrated among a small number of, of beneficiaries. In Medicare, the top 25% of beneficiaries account for 85% of costs. That kind of concentration you also see in Medicaid and in the rest of the health system. So again, the, I think the two key facts that you see replicated across different sectors of the health system are lots of variation that you don't see uh, uh, associated with, with improvements in, in outcomes and significant concentration among a, uh, in, of total costs from a small share of beneficiaries. This second fact limits the ability of consumer cost sharing to reduce costs because we are very likely as a nation to provide very generous insurance against catastrophic cases. Even the design of a health savings account which sort of embodies the notion that we should have more cost sharing on the consumer side provides catastrophic insurance. And therefore there is an inherent limit to the traction you get from consumer cost sharing because such a large share of costs are accounted for in the sort of catastrophic range. There's some effect, and I would note even the RAND experiment suggests that cost sharing on the non-catastrophic part of uh, spending could have some effect on the catastrophic part, 
So there's some, sort of some spillover there. But nonetheless, that limits the degree to which uh, a consumer-led cost-sharing approach will capture the full opportunity to reduce costs at minimal adverse consequences for health outcomes. Which brings me back to a key point. In healthcare, to a first approximation, I think we get what we provide financial incentives for providers to provide. So we have a lot of, uh, we have strong incentives for high-end technology, we get a lot of that. We don't have strong incentives for preventative medicine, we don't get a lot of that. So therefore, a key design mechanism for the health system is how to use the power of incentives for, for providers and physicians and, else, and others to deliver higher value care than we currently obtain. And I think to do that will require more information on what works and what doesn't, and then it will also require a sophisticated approach to aligning incentives to deliver higher value care rather than just more care. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I, I truly think that was an excellent overview um, of healthcare and both of the picture looking forward if we do nothing and of the possibilities where there probably are the, the, the most hope for making changes to the system. Um, it does from hearing this dawn on me that perhaps the two MRIs I got for carpal tunnel were unnecessary, but that was in the past. Um, I would like to start with a question, and then I know that, that we're going to have a, a robust question and answer session. Um, one of the most interesting things about healthcare in my mind is that when we talk about healthcare, probably everybody in this room thinks about it from a slightly different perspective. For me, most often, um, I think about it as part of the long term fiscal challenges and part of the budget picture. So I'm going to ask you a question on that, and then I know we'll get more in depth in actual healthcare policy. So, um, let me turn this on. Yeah, thank you. So, um, the possibility of a savings of 5% of GDP for basically healthcare, the low hanging fruit of healthcare reform is astronomical. The promises there are truly um, amazing and I almost feel like everyone should stop working on other things and work solely on that. Um, and in some ways that's the argument these days on fiscal policy, but I guess I'm not convinced that that's where the solution will be. So my question is, um, do you ultimately think that what we will need to do to close the long-term fiscal gap in this country, which is quite large over time, not so problematic in the short term, but very problematic in the long term, will that come, do you believe, primarily from health care reform, or will it come from a mix of health care, revenues, other entitlement policy programs, other budget rules? Where do you see the solution? Well, there are, lot, there, there are lots of different ways of structuring it. I think it's very likely that ultimately there will be a mixture of steps taken. But I guess what I would say is, if you did everything else, and you didn't tackle this, you wouldn't get that far. Um, this is the central long-term fiscal challenge facing the United States. So look between today and, and 2050 in our projections. Medicare and Medicaid costs go up by 8% of GDP. That is four times as large as the increase in Social Security costs. That is uh, four times as large as the size of the 2001 and 2003 tax legislation, assuming that the AMT uh, is reformed so that it doesn't take back uh, the, the effects of that tax legislation over time. So just looking where the money is, while those other, uh, you know, other policy options are clearly relevant and could help, by far the most important thing is whether we can bend this curve. And, and again, I believe that we are, given that observation, way underinvesting in analyses and options that uh, could help I help policymakers identify specific things they could do. And I am trying to augment CBO's ability to do that, but we need the help of think tanks in the foundation world and the academic world. We are seriously misaligned in terms of our uh, <coughs> investment of resources. and significantly overinvested in writing books about social security reform and significantly <laughs> under and I am me too significantly underinvested in writing books about bending the curve I should have put Peter's book on social security reform for sale outside <laughs> <laughs> okay can I open it up for questions please yes here in the front uh, I'm Victor Bess a consultant in national security policy uh, about a year ago I published an article on, on this subject and my conclusion was that the cost of health care are killing the viability of the country that is looking into the future. 
It is killing our military budget, killing multiple list of other programs that are necessary for uh, uh, for uh, the ability of the country. Now, my conclusion was uh, that one means, and this is not the principal means, and that was very interesting what you said, the fact of excess costs, which uh, has to be reduced. Uh, one of the principal means for reducing cost in healthcare is paradoxically increasing human longevity by biogerontological means, and I underline this, by biogerontological by means. I attended conferences and associated uh, with many biogerontologists over the past six or seven years, and they are saying now that if they, in, if they have adequate funding, and they can increase human longevity by up to 20 years free of aging-related diseases. This is, uh, I stress this, free of aging-related diseases, free of cancer, free of cardiac diseases, and so on and so forth. So if we get this, we will significantly reduce the cost of, uh, of uh, uh, health care. Also, we will increase the cost of social security, obviously, too. But on balance, the cost reduction will be so much greater. The problem with this is that after the 20 years, uh, Can we make sure that there is a question okay. in this? OK. Uh, I'll, I'll, a couple more sentences. Okay. <laughs> after the 20 years, these aging-related diseases will come back. So my solution is, I'll take the 20, year, the 20 years of uh, free of aging-related diseases. As soon as I exhausted that, I commit suicide, and uh, that's it. Let, let me, uh, maybe you should have ended before the <laughs> couple <laughs> sentences, but uh, <laughs> uh, let, me, let me make a couple remarks. Um, I promised you a provocative Q&A. There we go. Uh, the first thing is to, uh, this allows me to flesh out a little bit more why the demographic effect, that is, uh, and specifically, the aging, sh the share of the population in different age categories doesn't have that big of an effect on the projections. And I'm going to give you a very simplified example, which is an exaggeration, but I, I want to, uh, just for uh, pedagogical purposes, make the point that consider a world in which you're basically healthy, you're healthy, you're healthy, you're healthy, and so your health care costs are very low, and then you get really sick and die. Uh, if we're adding more years of life in the healthy years, which the evidence suggests is indeed the case, that is, as mortality rates have come down, morbidity rates have also, so we're adding more um, healthy years. You're adding more of those low-cost years to the system, and the pure effect of aging is still it, it, you know, if you're going to have the high cost at the end of life, that's always going to occur regardless of whether you live to 80 or 85 or 90. So the pure effect of longer life expectancies is not as large as you would think because you're disproportionately adding low cost years. Now that's different from saying that the longer life expectancy actually reduces costs. The way I would say it instead is if we add more years of life and the cost impact is not significant, but those are years of uh, productive years. We either can better afford the overall cost because more people are working, or at the very least, we're all enjoying the fruits of life for a longer period of time, and that's a good thing also. Um, and I guess I would sort of leave it at that. It's clear that there are many exciting pot uh, possibilities in uh, biological sciences and elsewhere in terms of uh, the effects of, of innovations on life expectancy. And one of the reasons that the demographic, or at least the age distribution part of these projections is not as large as you might otherwise think is that is precisely that you're adding more years of relatively healthy living. Yes. Hi, I'm Barbara Smith, and I'm a health policy consultant. Um, I wanted to ask you a, a more technical question about um, scoring and preventive services. Okay. Because you talk about the lack of investment in preventive services. Um, but I think that in the past it's been difficult in the CBA's methodology to capture the returns on prevention and make those a scorable gain that makes those investments possible. Um, and just as an aside to that, in terms of uh, higher co-payments and cost sharing, 
Um, there have been some studies done by large companies that when they actually reduce cost sharing for certain types of chronic illnesses, the compliance improves dramatically and overall costs come down. So um, I guess my question is how do you wrap all of that into scoring and get a return within the five or ten year window that's required to make those investments possible? Uh, good question. First, let me deal with cost sharing because uh, I think the evidence suggests that both providers and, and consumers do respond to the financial incentives that they face. And so if you reduce cost sharing requirements on a certain subset of uh, interventions, you are more likely to get consumers, say, to follow those interventions. The trick or the difficulty is right now we are not doing a very good job, partly because we don't have the evidence, on encouraging the higher value interventions. So one of the things that I would hope would ultimately come about is that we have enough information to design a system so both on the provider side and on the consumer side we're encouraging the valuable care through financial incentives for providers and, and the cost sharing and other requirements for consumers and not adopting uh, as blunt an approach as is typical today where uh, partly because we don't have the information the financial incentives are not aligned to delivering and uh, receiving high value care. In terms of CBO scoring, um, let me make a couple points. One is that uh, a lot of the things that people believe will save money over time are slow acting and take time to mature and we do not <laughs> choose the budget window. The Congress has chosen the budget window for scoring purposes and I am often blamed for that, but it's not my fault. <laughs> so that's the first observation. The second observation is even within the 10-year window, in many cases, the evidence in favor of something that we all believe couldn't, must work, is not as compelling or is not even present to the degree that would be necessary to score saving. I'll come back to that in a second. But the third thing in this, I want to get to this quickly, when we have evidence that there will be, uh, that there, when we have evidence that something reduced costs, we, are, we will score cost savings. I think there has been a perception that CBO is sort of uh, philosophically opposed to anything that would save money in the healthcare system on the theory that nothing could possibly work. And what I want to make clear is to the extent that there is specific evidence that this or that will reduce costs. We, are, we will and we have started and we have in the past, but I'm just making it very clear that we will score savings. Let's talk about some of the specific examples though. Prevention, for example. Um, the specific policy interventions that have been demonstrated to reduce costs over a five or ten year window are not as uh, robust, to use Maya's word, as I, you know, as many of us would like. And I guess what I would say is we are open to evidence, and I have actually uh, gone out of my way to request uh, data from uh, a lot of health insurance plans, for example, are experimenting with lots of different things. And I think that's terrific. And to the extent that we can, um, I can't go by, you know, some CEO walks in and says, well, we did this and it worked. I can't go by that. So uh, to the extent that we obtain reliable analytical information showing that an intervention, whether it's on prevention or disease management or care coordination or what have you, it works. We will score it. So we are we are open for uh, open for information, basically open for evidence. Yeah, please. Hi, I'm, I'm Charles Rary, healthcare economist at the Altar Institute in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, when you plot those charts under current law, that's assuming there's no government spending being allocated to people who are currently uninsured and who have become uninsured over time, I presume. So if you had another chart counting the number of likely uninsured through 2050 or 2082, it would be going up dramatically, I would bet. And so let's suppose we do something about that and we have an individual mandate or something like that with subsidized uh, premiums, government subsidizing premiums for those who can't afford it. Over time, they're going to have more people who can't afford it because the wages are not going to be rising as quickly as health care costs. Have you, you know, I just wonder what that would look like as another strip of government spending and what the growth rate would look like 
that because I think that would grow faster than the Medicare and Medicaid because the numbers falling into the need a subsidy category would continue to increase fairly dramatically. Well, let me tell you what we assumed. In particular, we assumed that uh, the share of non-Medicare, non-Medicaid spending in the form of employer-sponsored um, spending or uh, health care would remain constant at just under 60 percent. I believe the figure is 58 percent. That could come about through various mechanisms, whether uh, you had uh, higher costs being offset by uh, some employer dropping and therefore more uninsured or it could be uh, slower growth and then more people being added to those roles. We didn't break out all the various different uh, configurations of the evolution <coughs> of the employer-sponsored system, which will have a very significant effect on the number of uninsured people uh, in the projections, but instead took this sort of aggregate approach, in part because it's so difficult to predict how the rest of the health <coughs> system will respond in terms of the specific interventions, again, you know, whether it's utilization management or um, various different cost containment techniques or uh, increased cost sharing for employees or simply employer dropping and what that will do. We didn't attempt in this analysis to break that all out. Yes, right there. The amendment seems to be the stand. Um, Bruce Steinwald, GAO. You mentioned the need to build the evidence base on what works and what doesn't. My two-part question is, job should that be? And then second, what mechanisms, if any, are needed um, for the new evidence to influence the way medicine practices? Okay. Uh, we're going to be coming out with a report on this topic uh, before the end of the year, so there will be uh, a much more elaborate answer to your question, which is a good one. Um, and let me say a couple things. First, there is some of this kind of activity that's already being undertaken, both by uh, insurance plans and by a small agency within the Department of Health and Human Services. But I believe most observers think that the scale is nowhere near what would be warranted or beneficial. And in fact, in, uh, a question many people ask is, well, why aren't insurance companies doing more of this? And I think the answer is, uh, uh, there are several answers to that. One is that a lot of this information is essentially a public good. If you find out that intervention A is more effective than intervention B, that has implications for lots of people beyond your beneficiary roles. In addition, uh, the insurance companies do face a variety of just simple kind of data limitations. Uh, insurance claims databases, for example, typically don't have health outcomes uh, tagged onto them. And so combining the spending with the outcome can be difficult. Because we have an employer-based system, there's turnover, and so you're miss you lose part of your sample, and that also reduces your incentive to undertake the research in the first place, because if you find out that intervention A pays off over three or four years, what's the point of doing it if you're gonna, if you're gonna lose a lot of the people that you are investing in up, up front, for example? All of which leads many observers to believe that, that uh, increased federal support for this kind of activity will be necessary if it is to be undertaken at the scale that many observers believe would be warranted. How that federal support, though, is channeled is an open question. There are different models for whether it need to be undertaken by a federal agency or whether a quasi-governmental uh, thing could, or entity or entities even, could uh, undertake it. And, and our report will go through many of the different models for uh, expanding this kind of research. And then you also asked about uh, how the results of the research then get embodied in practice. And I think that's an absolutely essential question and, by the way, should feed into the design of the effort in the first place because it does no good to come out with uh, this study or that study that doesn't have credibility with the medical profession because you're not then going to drive behavior. And there are two ways in which you could affect uh, I, I think the sociology of the medical profession is very fascinating, but there are two ways of affecting that behavior. Um, one is the simple provision of information, I believe, does affect behavior. And uh, knowing that, um, you know, the, the, the reports, for example, on I put up the aspirin upon admission, the simple reporting of, of those statistics has significantly expanded uh, simple steps like that. But when it comes down to it, the biggest uh, return will come if you tie financial incentives to the results of the research. So uh, 
I think it's very unlikely in the United States that we'll ever have on-off switches. So we, uh, you know, if intervention A is proven to be more effective than intervention B, we simply don't do intervention B. But we are already all used to, um, you know, formularies and other things on uh, drug plans where you pay more, or you pay, let me <coughs> phrase it this, you pay less for a generic or a preferred brand. And you can imagine systems of payments where uh, financial incentives for providers are such that if they do intervention A, they're paid more than if they do the less effective intervention B. Or other systems where you still allow some degree of uh, individual physician flexibility, but try to um, provide incentives for what the evidence suggests is more effective. And again, I'll just come back to, I, I believe that this is an absolutely essential thing to understand because uh, many people believe that healthcare is just different and healthcare is different, but it's also, and it's also affected by economic incentives. And I do believe that if you look across a whole variety of aspects of the health system, we wind up with what we provide strong financial incentives to providers to provide. And um, therefore, if you want a higher value healthcare system, you need to change the, the structure of incentives for providers. Just to stay on that topic for one more moment, because I think the whole question of developing the perfect incentive system is, is so fascinating. One, is there sort of um, a proposal out there for a mix of incentives that you think would be most effective? And two, is do you have a preference for incentives on the provider versus the consumer side, or will it definitely be a blend of both? Let me answer the second question first. There's often this uh, uh, sort of divide in the health world between the sort of consumer types and the provider types. And uh, it's like you can only operate on one side of the equation. I see no reason why both sides of the scissors can't be doing some work. Um, and financial incentives affect both providers and consumers. And they need not be mutually exclusive. If you force me into a mutually exclusive world, I would say that coming back to the comments I made about the consumer side, if we are going to provide insurance against catastrophic costs, there's an inherent limit to how much traction we get out of consumer cost sharing because we're only mm -hmm. going to be applying that cost sharing to a smaller, uh, you know, to the to a, a small share of overall cost. On the very on the different financial incentives, uh, there are. I don't believe that we actually have the information base yet mm -hmm. to design an appropriate system. We, we have infrastructure building that we need to do. We need to build out uh, electronic health records which can then serve as an information source for this kind of analysis. You need an entity or entities that can undertake the analysis. You need changes in federal law so that Medicare can be transformed from a fee-for-service to a fee-for-value system. There are lots of things that people are playing with but are not in place yet. So the typical adage that uh, you know, all we need to do is lock policymakers in a room and not let them out until they've solved the problem just doesn't apply because no one knows specifically what to do. I have not seen a credible long-term plan to restore solvency to Medicare and Medicaid, period. There are tons on Social Security, some small share of which I've written. <laughs> there are none on Medicare and Medicaid. And that is a stunning gap. Uh, I'd like to call my colleague Shannon Brownlee. I also just want to mention that Shannon is the recent author of a new book called Overtreated. Uh, and we also, from New America Foundation, have another book by Phil Longman called uh, Bus Care Anywhere, which chronicles the successes and kind of analyzes the VA healthcare system. So, Shannon, thank you. Um, I want to thank Peter for a really terrific talk, an incredibly clear talk on this, on this very complicated issue. And I'm completely in agreement with you on the, on the problem of, of needing to build the evidence base and the need for comparative effectiveness research and the fact that, that it is a public good and therefore there has to be some <coughs> role, a greater public role in doing it. My question, though, is that I don't think comparative effectiveness is going to, to reduce spending in the short term enough. And it also can't really address, even when we have all the evidence, you know, how are we going to address the fundamental problem of overcapacity in, in various places in the country and the problem that supply of medical resources is driving a great deal of what's delivered? I think it's a very good question. I, I view the supply side of, uh, you know, many people look at that map that I put up and they note correctly that hospital beds per capita and specialists per capita uh, are higher in the darker regions, which is correct. But again, I come back to the payment system. I believe that our payment system facilitates that uh, 
that that outcome, and that uh, in a sense the the um, supply side aspect is a mechanism through which the lack of evidence and and the financial incentives we provide is delivered. So. I know that many other people believe, and there are there are options out there that that you know can be evaluated, that we should adopt a a more uh, kind of command and control regulatory approach to um, you know only allowing a certain number of specialists or what have you in different areas. I think those can be debated, and they're important topics. The political economy of that kind of approach seems to me quite uh, difficult. So I guess I would come back to, I agree with you that uh, comparative effectiveness research, as just one example, is unlikely to significantly reduce costs in the near term. And just underscore that, therefore, there are many things that we need to be doing starting now and trying different things. And on that point, I would also highlight, coming back actually to the question about uh, that I got about CBO scoring, to CMS's credit, CMS is conducting a whole variety of pilot projects on different things, care coordination, disease management, pay for performance, which are exactly the kind of activities that we need to be undertaking to see you know, what the evidence suggests on whether there's a return to that. And I'd also note, by the way, just on scoring, that some of the things that we you know, intuitively believe will help reduce costs, including care coordination, the pilot projects thus far are not providing very significant evidence of any cost savings, if anything, actually the care coordination demonstration project, for example, suggesting if anything it may go in the other direction. Um, so my view is that there's a lot of kind of infrastructure building and research and uh, laying the groundwork that can be done, but that we're not in a position today to make the hard decisions that will actually reduce costs without harming quality. And we need to be investing a lot more <laughs> in that effort because the longer we wait, the hard, you know, we're, just, we're losing time. We needed to start on this, to say it's yesterday is a cliche, we needed to start on this when Medicare started. 15, 20 years ago, yeah. Yes, in the back. I'm Roger Kochek with the Computing Technology Industry Association. The question I have has to do with the use of information in healthcare, not medical technology, but information. Mm -hmm. For at least two decades, the theory has been that the greater use of information technology um, would significantly uh, reduce the rate of growth in, in uh, healthcare and actually improve the quality of service, both on the consumer side by um, digitizing medical records and permitting the physician to pull up all the records instantaneously, and on the supply side by digitizing medical information and permitting the physician to look at MRIs taken over the whole world for the last 10 years and what works and what doesn't work. So the theory is that for a modest upfront investment, you can have a significant, perhaps enormous, but significant uh, impact on costs. And at the same time, by coincidence, both improve quality and improve the security of medical records. Have you, my two questions are first, obviously you've looked at this, you've mentioned it already, it's, it's a dominant theme in both the Democratic and Republican approaches to um, health care. Um, what are your views on the role of information technology, and how did you take that into account in the, uh, in the projections that you developed? Uh, first, let me just say, on health information technology itself, I believe the biggest return to health information technology will be to provide uh, a source of information that can be utilized to explore many of the opportunities we've been discussing. And in fact, on that point, I believe that the medical profession will, out of necessity, be forced to deal with the imperfections of panel data econometrics, where you're following lots of people over time and trying to tease out causation from observed correlations when you're controlling for everything you can possibly control for at exactly the same time that economists, having grown frustrated with the imperfections of that approach, are yearning for randomized control trials <laughs> that have dominated the health profession. Um, the second thing, though, is if all you did is put in an advanced HIT system in the absence of some structure to use that information and to tie financial incentives to it, I believe that many of the estimates that are floating around 
with regard to the cost savings that would accrue just from uh, putting in an HIT system are very substantially exaggerated and would not show up in any way in a CBO score of uh, that kind of approach. So uh, HIT as part of a broader system of changes that may help to arrest cost growth or slow cost growth, something that, that seems uh, uh, many analysts believe are, is promising. By itself, not clear. Beryl Kuzner with the Center for Science and the Public Interest, but also do a lot of freelance writing and my own blog on healthcare issues. Uh, Dr. Ronald Wellman, in his recent book, His Second Opinion, basically says we have to scrap the fee for service system. And he says there won't be fundamental reform. I'm curious if CBO is going to at least be leaning in that direction or talking about that or what you think about that as an issue uh, when you do your other. We report. don't lean. <laughs> you know, the, the second, I have a, a separate question about just get it out on the table. It had to do with the statistic that I found intriguing in, your, in, in the report talking about individuals pay 33% of uh, GDP uh, of health care costs, costs rather back in 1975, uh, and now it's down to 13%. So that leads one to the logical conclusion that consumers ought to pay more in order to get more skin in the game in order to reduce costs. But if you actually do the math, overall health care costs, it was 6% of GDP then, it's 15% now. That means consumers are still paying about 2% of GDP on, you know, for health care. And so therefore, you know, in a time when we have basically stagnant household budgets, asking them to pay more, uh, it has to be questions Let me uh, first uh, talk about Dr. Relman's book, which I've read. And in fact, uh, we uh, regularly have outside speakers come in to make sure that we are uh, keeping uh, abreast of developments, and we recently had him in to talk to senior staff at CBO. Um, I guess all I would say is that CBO is exploring all possible mechanisms that might uh, uh, ultimately reduce costs. I don't know that I would describe his proposal or his approach as scrapping fee-for-service. He is particularly focused on for-profit as opposed to not-for-profit mechanisms. But generically, um, what we're trying to do is provide analysis of options to policymakers, regardless of, you know, you, you had said lean, regardless of our own preferences. We're, we're our job is just to say, here are the pros and cons, or here are the likely effects. And his approach, uh, you know, if, if policymakers wanted to explore, I think we would, we would be capable of uh, evaluating. Um, <coughs> what was your other question? Uh, oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, again, I think the relevant question for uh, mm. you're you're right, and I, I again I want to make it clear I'm not advocating anything. I'm just saying that one of the consequences of that reduc reduced share, and the relevant thing is not the dollar amount, but uh, but as a share of total health spending. So for each additional MRI, what share are you paying, basically? Um, the fact that that has gone down has raised overall costs. And that was my only point. It, if, if you want to then jump to we should have higher cost sharing, what I would say is that's for you to evaluate. The effect of it would be to reduce costs somewhat overall. And uh, one could design approaches like that to uh, you know, reflect income distribution and to, to, to take into account equity concerns and what have you, but again, the evidence suggests that more cost sharing does reduce overall spending. Yes. I'm Anthony Odium with Georgetown Public Policy Institute. Given that other developed countries organize themselves differently, it's a starting point. Nonetheless, they face the same two basic challenges you've outlined, knowing what works, developing incentives. How much of CBO's effort is being put into looking at possible lessons from ways other developed countries approach those, those problems? Well, uh, let's take comparative effectiveness, for example. The poster child for comparative effectiveness research is the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in the UK. Um, so we actually had officials from NICE, what a nice acronym, from NICE, <laughs> in to visit us to learn about uh, their structure and how they conduct, uh, conduct their business. Um, and we are obviously uh, tracking and uh, monitoring the research that is being done on cross-country comparisons because that's 
an additional source of insight into the opportunities in our health system. One point I note, which is often not remarked upon, is going back to that graph of uh, the chart of the United States. There are significant areas of the United States that are delivering health care at the same or lower cost as many European or other <coughs> countries at comparable quality. So if you look at those lighter areas of that graph, we often do the United States versus, uh, I don't know, the Netherlands or the UK or what have you. And um, the US average or the US total is significantly affected by those red areas. If you look at health care delivered in, I don't know, Minneapolis, for example, there are, there, uh, the international comparisons to parts of the United States look a lot different. And I think that is important to realize that contained within the United States are examples of healthcare systems that are delivering care at the same or lower cost and the same or better quality than other countries. Anyone else? Okay. Is there one more question or are we all set? Good. Thank you. Um, I guess I would just like to say that uh, as a healthcare novice, um, I, I felt like this overview was absolutely fabulous, Peter, and that this report is um, more in-depth and fabulous in that way. So thank you to the great work that CBO is doing. Thank you to the full staff of CBO for a really wonderful report. Thank you for joining us today, and thanks to all the guests and the good Q&A session.